Sai Baba is a phenomena the like of which has never visited this planet before. Why is he here? He is here on a mission to move mankind to a new age. Um, I have not the slightest reservation that Sai Baba in his next 20 years is moving mankind and pushing mankind to a global civilization. This is the book. Uh, Leadership Book for Youth, Parents and Teachers, Education and Human Values. And he told you to write this? He not only told, he <laughs> made me sit down and uh, it took two months to clear up concepts and uh, he guided everything. And he's, it's the only book on which Swami has written a foreword in his own hand. That's the foreword? That's the foreword by Swami. Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba, Forward Leadership and Idealism in Action. And he writes it and he signs it from December 1993. Good job. With love, Baba. I was responsible, I was the Adjutant General of the Indian Army. Responsibility for personnel. An Indian Army is a multi-religious army. Mm -hmm. And when I saw this emblem, it triggered an idea which eventually developed into setting up the Army Institute of National Integration. Uh, India had never had this before. Never had this. But um, in spite of all these differences which are visible today on the world, this institute has played a very cardinal role. And it's very simple uh, to tell each religious group their own basic religion, but also familiarize them with other religions, eventually understanding that there is just one God. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's exactly what Sai Baba says. That's right. He is a man of many strengths and great faith, Lieutenant General Dr. M. L. Chibber. Dr. Chibber left the Indian Army in 1985 and for a long time now has been a follower of Holy Man Sri Sancha Sai Baba. In the Army for more than 40 years, he was highly regarded as Adjutant General and Director of the Military Operations and then served as Visiting Professor at Sai Baba's University in Puttaparthi. Welcome to Sojourns. This interview was recorded overlooking Central Park in Sai Baba devotee Hal Honig's apartment in New York City in September 2003. You see, uh, Hal was there with a group of young adults and Baba showered his love on them. I think you had eight or nine interviews and he loaded them with goodies. And sometime later, one day he called Hal and this body and one more person, I forget who it was. And we talked about various things and he suddenly looked at Hal and said, uh, Hal, what is youth? And Hal said, Swami, youth is determination because he was teaching them determination, repeating over and over again. And then he asked Hal, determination for what? Hal was foxed, he looked at me. I was even more foxed and I looked out of the door. <laughs> and then he gave this input. He said, determination to keep your senses under control with, and he used this gesture, unwavering steadiness. And then he went on to explain it. In brief, he said, look at Mahabharata. The commander-in-chief of the bad guys, Bhishma, was 114 years old and he's a youthful commander-in-chief because he had led a life with unwavering steadiness control over his senses. And then he ended up by saying that if you have your senses under control, you can be youth at the age of 80. And if you don't have your senses under control, you can be an old person at the age of 18. And that lesson 
always sticks in my mind as an input. It was after this book, but input where of what he taught once that determination is the king of all qualities of human beings for evolution also. To understand who we are requires determination, tenacity, perseverance. And I think that lesson has made a deep impact on me. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Is that what that you see? Ultimately, our role as human beings is to understand who we really are. The only quest I pray to Baba is to uh, reach this constant awareness that this body is a temporary housing for the real Chibba, the real I. Chibba is a temporary drama name. <laughs> you know, oh. Hal, it's, it's amazing that you say that um, so we might object to violence. Can I give you uh, some... Absolutely. Some um, to, to that? Yeah, sure, because you I'd see, love you to give it to Michael. When, uh, when uh, this leadership uh, yeah. uh, teaching was going on in, the, in, 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 the, in Swami's university, I wanted to show them a film called 12 O'Clock High. Yeah, I know the you, film. You remember? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, I acquired the film because it's a very popular film for leadership. Uh-huh. And... Um, I showed it to the faculty, everybody liked it, and then somebody raised a question. Uh, can we uh, show this film when non-violence is a value that Swami teaches? So I said, well, nobody could take a decision. So I said, um, uh, everybody said we must ask, the, uh, ask Swami about it. So I asked the dean, I said, uh, you ask it. He said, not me, it's your idea. You <laughs> I, I went and sat up with the film, and Swami knows everything. Uh, when he called that very often, he called people in interview, he called me also. And I was carrying this uh, cassette. He says, what's the problem? I said, Swami, we wanted to show this film. And uh, some of us feel that uh, maybe it's not right to show this because it's, it's a war picture. He says, where is the problem? There's a war going on inside all of us all the time. We went and showed the film. <laughs> and this film, if you remember, we showed it in the workshops around the world. Yeah. You see, today at a very st interesting stage, you know, you all are in Iraq, you are in Afghanistan, uh, there's big trouble in Palestine. Korea. Korea. Now, people get concerned and disheartened. For God's sake, don't let people get disheartened. That's the point I was asking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. You must stay the course because it's a tremendous accelerating opportunity for mankind to pick up its pace and move to a new world. One question about that. As a journalist, it's of endless intrigue to me. Let's say two examples. The Palestinians decide to put down their arms and all of a sudden they feel they're being attacked by Israel. The Israelis put down their arms and they feel they're being attacked by Palestine. Yeah. It goes back and forth, yeah. back and forth. Same way with Kashmir, yeah. with Pakistan, yeah. with India. Yeah. Same way in Northern Ireland. Mm. What is it in your estimation, having been there, that's going to one day cause the cessation of violence, this tit for tat that goes back and forth endlessly? Mm. And can Baba be of help? Yeah. You see, at the source of this tit and tat is a lethal combination of king and clergy. King and clergy? Yes. It has happened in all civilizations in the last 3,000 years. The earliest was in India. So you're saying these are all wars of religion? Not religion, exploitation of religion. Exploitation of religion. You see, Voltaire, uh, was the first guy who articulated this, that this lethal combination has played up havoc into mankind, this combination of king and, or in today's word, power brokers and marketing managers of religions who exploit God as a smokescreen, sharely for power. And it is here that Baba's teachings come, become relevant. And he's given a beautiful blueprint for the future civilization. It's not that he's talking fuzzily. And he says on this planet, 
there is only one nation, nation of humanity. There is only one religion, religion of love. There is only one language, language of heart. And there is only one God, and he is omnipresent. So, these are not empty words. This is a scientific reality. Then how can each of us in our own individual silent way work according to Baba's will to contribute towards that ultimate goal of global peace? Yes. Uh, understand his teachings and reprogram ourselves to become persons of character. And if you like, I hope I'm carrying a card. I must give it to you. Just one minute. Okay. The end product Oh, I see what you're getting at. Our effort should be to answer this question. Are you a person of, of character? character? And that person has been described at the back from this book. An honest person, Satya, and Dharma, a person who has sense of duties and obligations of his position, whatever it may be, Dharma, a person who tells the truth, Satya, a person who gives others their due, Prima, person who can consider it of the weak, ahimsa, oh. a person who has principles and stands by them, dharma, a person not too elated by good fortune and not too depressed by bad, santi, I would call that equanimity too, a person who is loyal and a person who can be trusted. And if you read this book, General Matthew B. Ridgway has described a person of character. In different words, the sense is exactly the same. What did bring you initially to Sai Baba? Oh, uh, it was a long search. Uh, we went around the mulberry bush of spirituality, a um, number of gurus number of wise people and then somebody gave us a book by Harvard Muffet uh, and she got a book from her brother uh, one of these annual publications and more or less how many years ago was this this was in 79 okay and had you ever heard of Sai Baba until that time no I had I in 75 I was commanding a division on India-Pakistan border at Amritsar. Baba had come there and we were invited to be there. But then the time was not right. <laughs> Foolishly, uh, I gave priority to some conference and didn't go there. I wish I had. And then later, when you had a chance to explore the writings of Howard Murphy, was it by a book that you first found out about Sai Baba? Yeah. How, Howard Murphy's book? Reading that book gave me a feeling that uh, maybe there is something which we unknowingly were searching might be found from him. And in your childhood, in your uh, young adulthood, surely you were exposed to a multitude of spiritual ideas and spiritual paths. Yes. Uh, the spiritual ideas were there that there is a God and you go looking for it and uh, for many years we used to go looking for Shiva in the Himalayas uh, but the, the idea as to what God is was not quite clear and um, on, after reading that book she organized a bhajan in the army house there at where I was posted I was then commanding our country's uh, uh, strike call and um, that bhajan was done by the local Sai organization at a place called Chandigarh, okay. which is capital of uh, Punjab. Mm -hmm. And that bhajan did something which is very difficult to put in words. But both of us felt that perhaps we found our way home. Now, in Indian culture and in Hinduism, you were already familiar with bhajans, correct? That's right, yes. What was it about these bhajans that set them apart from the others? It was, I think, the, uh, the depth of devotion of the singers. Uh, it was the precision with which the whole thing was organized. 
and the choice of words. Uh, but to be very honest, very difficult to expl explain, there's something triggered in us. And thereafter, things started happening. And um, uh, we knew that um, there is this power. And when, instead of being sacked, I was promoted and brought to Delhi, she said, see, he's done it. We must go there. You weren't worried about being sacked oh, because I of Sai Baba. No, no, I, was, I wasn't being worried at all uh -huh. for being sacked because there was an issue of principles. Uh, and um, instead of being sacked, uh, whatever I did was accepted and uh, moved to Delhi. And she said, he's done it. So the first thing, first outing after reaching Delhi was that within a month, we were down at Potaparati. And what was it like, if you can remember that first instant that you laid your eyes on Sai Baba, mm -hmm. what was that experience like for you? I wish you would ask her because she knows it much better than <laughs> I am. But it was waiting for three days and I had only three days leave. And I was getting impatient that, well, we've had our thing. And we sat there, we saw him, but there was no meeting. So I had to fly back. And um, she was saying, look, yeah, there are thousands of people. We are not the only ones. And then 3 o'clock, before 4 o'clock when we were due to leave, somebody came that Baba wants to see you. So we had our first uh, interaction with Bhagwan. That's the way it always is. Yeah. <laughs> were you dressed in your military uniform? Uh, no, I was in the mufti. Okay. I was in the and mufti. when you had that first... Oh, 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 she's pointing out, I changed to, to travel into okay. uniform. Okay, because yeah, you, you were about to leave. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you didn't have much time. You were going to be leaving at 4 o'clock. Yeah. Baba called you in at 3 o'clock. Tell us about that first meeting. Well, we went in and we sat down. Her mother was with us. He attended to her and talked to her. And then um, I was standing all the time. And he says, sit down, sit down, sit down. <laughs> and I squatted down. <laughs> and um, well, uh, I suppose to complete it, uh, he materialized a little uh, uh, small medallion and asked me to keep it, this will uh, protect you. Mm -hmm. So I, I just took it and um, I thought it was best. There was a little place for hanging around the neck. I put it around my neck and it's still there. Uh, but there is, a, there is a link later on. It's still this. there now? Yeah. <laughs> is there any way we could see it? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay, there it is. It's a Sai Baba's picture on there. That's right. And so that's from how many years ago, more or less? 30? 79. 79, 20... Uh, uh, this was 80. This is 80, back. okay, so 23 years ago. Yeah. Thank you. Now, what good fortune to have such wonderful proximity to Baba, mm -hmm. to meet him, and to have him materialize something for you. What were your thoughts in those early stages of getting to know Baba? Were you already a solid Sai Baba devotee or were you growing towards Sai Baba? I was growing, but that meeting, what really uh, triggered something was his emblem on the door. And um, I was responsible, I was the Adjutant General of the Indian Army, responsibility for personnel. And one knew that the way things were developing in India and the world, this religious differences, these religious differences are going to play up havoc into mankind. And Indian Army is a multi-religious army. Mm -hmm. And when I saw this emblem, it triggered an idea which eventually developed into setting up the Army Institute of National Integration. 
Uh, India had never had this before. Never had this. It took five years to do it, but it came because that has played tremendous dividends to the Indian Army of developing, and not really developing, but consolidating because we inherited this integration from the British also. But um, in spite of all these differences which are visible today on the world, this institute has played a very cardinal role. And it's very simple uh, to tell each religious group their own basic religion, but also familiarize them with other religions eventually understanding that there is just one God. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's exactly what Sai Baba says. That's right. So, um, it, it, was, it was something which, you know, a coincidence, but then a coincidence is happening when God <laughs> wants to be anonymous. He triggered this, it has helped the Indian Army, and we've stayed the course. How many more years did you stay with the Indian Army? I retired in 1985. And from 1980 onward, did you have many opportunities to go visit with Sai Baba again? Uh, yeah, I, I did go twice or thrice. Uh, we, did, uh, we did see him when he went, came to Delhi, but uh, not uh, uh, what, what is popularly called interview. Mm -hmm. well, we, we had darshans, and uh, so the life went on. And how many people who were fellow generals in the Indian Army, fellow officers. How many people were aware of Sai Baba and open to Sai Baba? Many. 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 Uh, but each one did it privately. And uh, today, for example, in this vintage car committee, uh, there is my predecessor as the CNC of Northern Command, General Malhotra. And that's the time Swami came to Kashmir. Uh, so he's, he, he knew about Baba. Much more senior than us was the Air Chief, who's also on this vintage car committee, uh, Air Chief Marshal Mehra. Uh, he knew about him. Uh, then there's another Naval Chief. Uh, he knew about him. And of course, you have the, the President today and uh, the uh, Prime Minister Prime more Minister? than President, because Prime Minister has been. Uh, older devotee than us also. <laughs> so, I have many questions to ask you. The one I want to ask right now is, can you describe how your life has been transformed because of Sai Baba coming into your life? Transformed to the extent that um, growing happiness, that, that all, as he says, it's that in this drama of the universe, there are only two actors. Well, does this mean that you didn't have much happiness earlier? No, we did have, we had a very good happiness life, but it's amazing how it grows. Everything is a source of happiness. And what do you think's up his sleeve when it comes to what the future holds for India and the rest of the world in the next decade or two? I think decade or two is, is, is a very, small time frame in the evolution of man. But um, I have not the slightest reservation that Sai Baba in his next 20 years is moving mankind and pushing mankind to a global civilization. And the speed started on 9-11. You think that was the beginning of it? That was not the beginning, but it was a, it was a push. Mm -hmm. Because um, it was a wake-up call that this last century, the, the bloodiest century in human history, is over. You are ready to move to a new age. Now get going. And that's why I, I uh, gave that little note uh, Americans have to play a very major role in this movement. And yet, as you go home, you still hear through the army channels of 
intelligence of the tensions on the Indian-Pakistani border. You see what's happening one, two, and three countries away from Afghanistan to Iraq to Iran and a little bit further to South to North Korea. And what must you feel about what seems to be sort of a contradiction? We seem to be speeded up towards global peace on one hand, and yet there are some real tensions to deal with on another. You know, it's interesting that you ask this, because the day I retired, on 31st of August, 1985, on 1st of September, I wrote to General Ziaul Haq that Mrs. Chibber and I are launching on a personal project called India-Pakistan Reconciliation. Mm. And he sent a very beautiful reply inviting both of us to visit Pakistan. Uh, we've not given it up. We've kept in touch with his successors, uh, including Pervez Musharraf. And uh, when he took over power, he invited us to go to Pakistan 2000. And we are utterly convinced that it is inevitable that reconciliation will take place. But looking at the global situation, which you just now articulated, all I would like to say is that these are frictions of change, inevitable frictions of change. They are such deep mindsets which will be removed. And that's what fascinates me in his mission of setting up the Sai International Center for Human Values. When this center was established, he named it International Center. We didn't know why. It was set up three years ago. And only last year, he appointed this committee of vintage cars. And for whatever reason, he made me, against little protest, the <laughs> convener, because I was the, the, the junior most in this lot, the, the convener of this committee and the director of the center. And the mission given is, in his own words, to develop into a vast global institution for human values. Have you noticed the irony that he has chosen a man who was in the army for his entire professional career, who retired as a general from the army, preparing his troops for war mm. to lead his troops after his retirement towards peace? You know, uh, again, it, it, it's marvelous that you are, do ask this question. I'm asked, how come you strayed into spirituality from being a soldier? Exactly. The, the set answer is, he always does that. <laughs> he didn't give the message of Gita in an ashram. He gave it on the battlefield of Mahabharata. He always does that. <laughs> if we understand uh, that there's only just one reality, and it's a drama that we are playing a part in it. And um, he's, he's doing it repeatedly, but we are slow learners. And I think he's going to teach the lesson to mankind to understand who we really are. Okay. General Chibber, I always like to ask this question. People sometimes say, don't you know the answer yet? But I always like to hear the different answers that come from different people to whom it's asked. And so I'll ask you, who is Sai Baba? I have given this reply also very frequently. And I'll say the same thing. Sai Baba is a phenomena, the like of which has never visited this planet before. Why is he here? He is here on a mission to move mankind to a new age. But let me qualify this. When we talk of this mission, and when he talks about avatars, he's not talking about just one. He's talking about almost 300 years. The era, it's called the Sai era. The Shirdi Sai, the Satya Sai, and eventually consolidation by Prem Sai. But the interesting part is that the next 20 years are going to be the most crucial 20 years in this broad spectrum of roughly 300 years, 1850, 
onwards. And um, these 20 years, uh, people like you. No, no, people have like to, you. He's going, no, to be, no, he's going no. to be here for 20 years. Well, he's your I, age. I, I'm, I'm, I'm advisedly saying this because this message has to reach every home in the, in the world. You see, people from 171 countries are coming to ashram to, to get spiritually inspired, to um, feel happy, to get his love. I want to but that's not enough. I want to underscore that before we move on. There aren't many more than 171 countries in the world. I think there's only so 100. We have to reach out to them. Yeah, so, yeah. but 171 countries have people coming to see Sai Baba every year. Well, it's taken 60 years, but it's always growing. You're in a country where you say great things are going to emanate because of the events of 9-11. And coincidentally, tomorrow is 9-11, right. 2003. Yet, and this is the second most popular question I ask, why do so few people in this big country know even of Sai Baba's name? Difficult to explain because um, uh, this country, mm, as uh, my wife says, it, uh, is at the height of Rajasik stage of life. Mm -hmm. You have made success in material life and in that 9-11 uh, was a bit of shake up that there's something more to just material prosperity. Happiness doesn't lie in that. And this awakening has prepared the stage for this country to understand what it is all about. And I think with people like you who can reach out to people because today uh, we can reach every home through the type of facility that you are running. Well, I'm just the person who turns the camera on. It's your message that will get out there. Mm -hmm. And let's say somebody happens to be watching this videotape. They knew a friend who knew a friend who knew a friend, and they have never heard of Sai Baba. They've never heard of you or your institute in Delhi. What could you tell those people who might feel a yearning of their heart to know more of what Baba wants of them? What can you tell them to do to learn more about their own spiritual growth? Perhaps the first thing is to do what triggered us, to read some of the books about him. And I think there are some fascinating books. Harvard Murphitt, uh, Phyllis Crystal from your own country. Well, we have a book right here, seems to me, written by somebody we know named General Chibber. Tell us about this book again. I know you mentioned it earlier, but I'd like to have you talk about it one more time for the sake of people who are let me see if I can get this here. Hearing about it for the first time, Sai Baba's, now what's that word? <laughs> On leadership. Tell me about this book again and why you wrote it and where it came from. You know, after I retired, I was, uh, for whatever reason, hijacked to run India's Management Development Institute. So what was the purpose of this institute that you were running that led up to this book? Uh, this institute is a management institute. And the chairman of this management institute was, while I was in the army, one of my advisors. And uh, he said, here is a management institute with all the infrastructure. We want to make it a real top class institute and he uh, asked me to take it on. I protested but he insisted and um, I was there for four years. And then when I started going back to Swami's uh, ashram, uh, he asked me to teach in the MBA program of Swami as well. I'm mentioning this because it's related to this book. All right. In Swami's MBA program, I later on discovered his was the only university in the world, including all your universities, 
which had an obligatory three credit course in the MBA program. That's hard to imagine. I had no idea yes. it was the only this was university. the only university. There were universities where there were some optional inputs, but his was the only university which had a three credit obligatory program. So I got involved in teaching in that uh, MBA program on leadership because a certain amount of awareness about leadership was there in the army. And then I started discovering that um, there is something much more to leadership than just what we learn from uh, guys like Matthew B. Ridgeway or Bratton and so on. Uh, there's much more to it. And for whatever reason, Swami started getting this body and a number of other professors and students into the interview room and he would question us on leadership. And during those sessions, which lasted about two to three months, he gave conceptual clarity, which eventually got written as this book. So, so you think there was a method to that plant in order to lead you down the path to write this specific book That's based right. on your background, yeah. his recognition that his was the only university teaching something related to this, and he sensed the time was right for you then to take it a step further. Well, uh, you see, at that time, one didn't even think about it, but looking back, there was a design in it. I, I say this advisedly because this is the only book about Baba which has been translated into nine languages. Nine languages? That's right. And it's because of American its English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Croatian. Croatians have gotten to second reprint, uh, Indonesian, uh, Ceylonese, and Chinese. Japanese. Uh, leaving the Indian languages out. And Japanese, yeah. Well, what did you learn from writing this that you didn't know before you put the first word down on page one? What did you learn from this process? You know, he simplified the whole process of leadership. After two hours discussion with the faculty and the students, and um, he says, leadership is to be, to do, to see, and to tell. It covers the entire process of leadership and that's why the title of the book is Mahavakya, the divine utterance, the, the great utterance. Uh, in four words, he just summed up the whole process completely. I saw that diagram in uh, your the book. Triangle. There's a triangle. Yeah. Uh, if you like, I can show it to you. Yes. Because and, and what's the most important element of that triangle? Because that's this is the, there the is, entire yes. process. And it begins at the top or the bottom? Top. To be? To be, to, to do, do, to see. And then to tell. And then to tell. And then to tell at the bottom, that's the crux of leadership? Uh, 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 no, the leadership, he said, to be is the beginning and end of leadership. Say more about each step, if you will. I must admit, when the book was written, I wasn't very clear as to what to be means. I thought to be a good person, person of character, this to the other. It's only after the book by these atoms of Sai came into being that one realized that to be means to be what you really are, temporary form of one reality called God. Of course, how could you ever understand what that was before learning about Baba? Those are just two words, to be. Uh, uh, well, uh, there's something in it, to be a good man, to, to man of courage, to this, that, the other. But the ultimate to be is to be Baba. Uh, that's right. But it's absolute clarity, scientific clarity, that yes, not only this human being, but 
everything in the universe, seen universe, is temple of God. And we are all playing a part in the drama. And that clarity has come many years later. But the book was written. And I think it's a reasonably good book to carry Baba's basic message of being persons of character. I once had a discussion with a young man across the street named Isaac Tigret, and after eight and a half hours of talking to him, my wife and I were about to leave, and he put his hand on my knee, and he said, you know, Ted, Sai Baba only cares about one thing. He doesn't care about your job. He doesn't care about your company, the marriage of your children. Sai Baba only cares about how you continue to grow your spiritual soul to its ultimate conclusion. Is that why we're here? Is that what it means to you it, it to be? That, it is that part. That you see, ultimately, our role as human beings is to understand who we really are. And it's fascinating how he guided a guy called Akbar, who's contributed in this book, step by step, over a period of almost oh, seven, eight years, to make him understand scientifically modern physics that yes, everything is a temporary form of energy plus needed level of consciousness. And everything has a shelf life, including this universe, including our planetary system, including this body, including this table, and that is to be. Well, General Chibber, you're a little bit over the age of 50, I think, today. Do you know what it means for you to be? I'm over 70 now, and uh, the only quest I pray to Baba is to uh, reach this constant awareness that this body is a temporary housing for the real Chibber, the real I. Chibber is a temporary drama name. <laughs> you are convinced that Baba has come to transform the world to an international community. You've said that. What has made you feel so convinced about that? What evidence do you have that Baba has come to transform this world into an international community? You see, these questions about evidence uh, are triggered by most of us, including this body, because there is a limitation we suffer from. And that limitation is that God-given microscope of quantum physics that we have, we use only less than 10% of it, the brain, because we place a ceiling, we lock ourselves and place a ceiling in our understanding by focusing our attention on what our senses can perceive. But the truth is that if we focus our, learn to focus our mind on the source, the amount of awareness of this brain increases beyond 10%. <laughs> and then this understanding starts coming and it comes in shoots things when you sit up in the morning uh, you never thought of uh, before they they come out i'll give you an example mm -hmm. the other day i rang up hal i was talking about this global civilization one word i sat and i was writing something and suddenly my this thought came that I read a book about one word, titled one word, and I said, who was it who read? And um, again, this thing came, it was Wendell Wilkie of your country. Mm -hmm. And I rang up Hal, I said, have you heard of this name and have you heard of Now, I assure you, I read this about 40 years ago, or 30 years ago. And suddenly, who put this, from where did this come? Who made this buried memory come up? 
it is this growth, this awareness that he is trying us to achieve and so that you view everything dispassionately as a temporary drama <laughs> and enjoy playing part in it. General Chibber, we have time for one last question and that is that we're talking about your youthfulness, that you're a child of Sai Baba. Sai Baba is your mother and your father and you're over 50, you're over 70, but you're still a young man. We're sitting here in the presence of somebody who's a little older than you, Crystal, who's right behind you. She's going to turn 90. So what about General Chibber? What do you plan to do with the rest of your life? Constant prayer to Swami to push this body to constant integrated awareness that all is one. Sai Ram, General, thank you very much. Yeah, we will Anyway, I'll deal with it as Baba speaks. I was a pretty young man. I didn't know when Baba was interviewing him. He was standing next to the wall in the uniform with all the red tags in the office. He was 5'11 and Baba is 5'2, written by Baba. They are like fresh books like what happened today. In this book which was written in the 70s, at each village in the world. And I thought there must be a contemporary background, right? It would be a